is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are talking a crazy, crazy day in the NBA and the betting implications of the injury to Kawhi Leonard and Chris Paul potentially being out for the Phoenix Suns. We're bringing on Coach Nick to break down his thoughts on both those situations in the current landscape of the NBA playoffs. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Dr. Dr. Ed Feng. You can find his work over at thepowerrank.com. And Ed, usually June is just basketball and hockey. This year it is Euro 2020. It yep. is the U.S. Open coming up this week. I'm excited about NASCAR. I'm probably the only one, but like there's it's a lot of stuff one. going on and a lot of stuff to be excited about. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. You know, Italy was up 2 nothing on Switzerland, so I, I could actually break away and uh, do this podcast today. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, Euro's been awesome. The quality of, of the soccer slash football is so high. Uh, we've seen teams like Italy look fantastic. Um, you know, Germany beat France. Ah, excuse me, France beat Germany yesterday. Um, so a lot of a lot of good matches. Uh, I'm completely obsessed with it. It's been it's been a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, look, look forward to more. And this is the first year where we've had legal betting in Michigan. So has that enhanced your your Euro viewing experience, having that at your your, your disposal? Yeah, for sure. Um, I actually haven't bet a game yet because I didn't really want to just trust my numbers. So sure. I was waiting for the the end of the the first set of group matches, which happened yesterday. And so now I have some sense of these teams. Um, I'll I'll be talking about it in in future episodes of of covering the spread. But do you feel um, pretty but... good about the way your numbers broke out for the first couple of games? I do. I do. Yeah. I mean, I, when I looked at it, I mean, it was pretty close to the markets, which is always a pretty good sign. Um, you know, and, and these markets are going to be pretty sharp, right? With the with the win, lose, draw probabilities. I think Rob was saying Pinnacle is taking 125K on these these types of bets. So, you know, it, it's a pretty, pretty sharp market. So uh, maybe looking at some team totals uh, instead as, a, as another way uh, to bet this. And then, you know, maybe some futures. Um, I'm, I'm actually about, I, I was thinking about talking about it today, but I just didn't have enough time to, to completely yeah. get my thoughts together about it. Um, so, but we have, we, the, the tournament's going on for a couple more weeks. We got some time. There's plenty of time there. There is plenty to discuss as well for today. Well, some U.S. Open thoughts from you and covering the future. I'll talk uh, some NASCAR as well. It's going to be a fun week, but we have to talk about the downsides too with the Kawhi Leonard injury and the CP3 news. We'll bring on Coach Nick to discuss that. He does a lot of YouTube coaching videos at B-Ball Breakdown on Twitter as well. A link to his YouTube page is in the description up on Number Fire, and they're fascinating videos to watch because, like, Ed, for me... I've never played basketball in my life, as people probably can tell if they watch the YouTube version of the show. I'm not a basketball dude. I'm six foot. I'm not doing anything there. I played it at like the, the local gym in college, and the 11-year-old kids beat me, and I retired. So I don't understand the X's and O's. Coach Nick does, and yeah. I love watching videos of people who understand a topic more deeply than I will ever be able to comprehend. I think that's, that's exciting me to have him on here for today. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, these these are like the core components of what go into points per possession and, and other things that we talk about. So, right. um, you know, I mean, the easy way to kind of handicap these things are having power ratings and stuff like that. And that's all well and good. But I think you have to under, understand that this aspect of the game as well, um, really, to you know, before making any bets, because it's it's important to what happens. We always want to find an edge, whatever that edge may be. And we'll talk to Coach Nick about his thoughts on Kawhi, CP3, and more coming up here in just a bit. But first, a quick reminder uh, to make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. We will not be here next week. Our first off week in... I think since I got married last July. So our first off week next week, we'll not have a show then. Uh, back the week after that, though, to talk more Euro, we'll talk some NBA, NHL, catch up on all that. So make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you hear, make sure you leave us a rating and review as well. Before we talk about the NBA playoffs ahead, we got to go back to last week as well and go back through our discussion with Hakeem Prophet talking about uh, the Suns and and the Nuggets, and also a little bit of thoughts on the Bucks and the Nets. Covering the past. 
Last week here on Covering the Spread, we had Akeem Profit on to talk about the second round of the NBA playoffs. You can find him on Twitter, at Ski Profit. And we talked to him before uh, Game 2 between the Nuggets and the Suns. He was on Denver, plus 5.5 in that game. Uh, he also wanted the full game total over 223.5 and the first half over 113. But the Suns were just suffocating that entire game, especially on defense. They kept the first half under at 94 points. The full game total was closer, uh, went under by two and a half there, and the Suns won by 25. So a crazy effort across the board by them. They went on to sweep that series. Obviously, game four a bit, you know, interesting, but they did sweep the series. So the Suns exceeding expectations throughout that Nuggets series. Uh, Keem is on the Nets money line at plus 140 against the Bucks in game three. They were down by 19 in the first quarter, but they actually had a lead late in that fourth quarter. Couldn't hit a shot in the final minutes. The Bucs uh, did hit shots, and they won 86-83. to 83. Uh, So check out Akeem over on the Locker Room app. Uh, he has the Profit Pick Show over there. We appreciate him coming on here last week as well. And, Ed, you were talking about Euro 2020. It sounds like some things may have gotten clarified uh, for you after that, though. Yeah, no, I kind of owe John Sheeran an apology because uh, <laughs> I didn't realize some things. So we talked about how England was uh, the, the second – most favored team behind France and England is never ever the second best team in Europe. They're, it, since I've been following the sport, they're just not. Um, but they they do have all three group map st- group stage matches at home at Wembley. Uh, the semi both semifinal matches and the final are at Wembley as well. That changes the odds and probably enough that you know the point four goals that I'm using for for home field advantage starts to come into play and and England all of a sudden is. Basically, almost on the same par as, as your France's and Belgium's in in my numbers. So, so that actually does make sense when you look at the games. I also goofed in terms. I talked about how uh, France was favored uh, against Germany in the first match, but then Germany was favored to win the group. Um, that only makes sense because uh, that actually makes sense because Germany has all three matches at home in Munich. Um, so they're going to have. Uh, I will say one thing. So my numbers had a slight edge for Germany in that match, and that's the way the markets did move uh, before the game closed. So uh, so that was good. So Germany ended up being a slight favorite. They did not win that game. Um, they they lost one nothing to France, um, but they will have they will have the home advantage in these these last two games, and that's why the markets had Germany as a favorite instead of France to win the group, which obviously changed because that that can't be that can't be the case anymore since France beat them, um, but. You know, it was a great match between like two of the best teams in the world. Uh, the only goal was an own goal uh, by a German defender who, oh, you know, the kind of the most remarkable thing. Uh, if you if you've heard of any soccer player, you probably heard of Kylian Mbappe, who is the, the French winger, who was a big part of their World Cup winning team uh, back in 2018. Uh, there was one play where a ball got kicked deep into the German territory and he went he he had maybe a five yard. Uh, the German defender who also had the own goal had a five yard head start to get into the ball and Mbappe beat him there by like Jeez. three yards. <laughs> it was ridiculous. I've never seen at that level. You would never think there would be a speed discrepancy between right. two players that much. So Mbappe gets the ball and then uh, the German defender, I mean, it makes a very good tackle uh, that eh, arguably was a penalty in the box, but it wasn't called. So, um, <laughs> But you know, I mean, Germany, France, Portugal. These are these are some of the best teams in the world. So if you're gonna if you're gonna find time this weekend to watch Euro, uh, w- watch watch those teams. Uh, the the Germany Portugal game is noon Eastern on Saturday. Uh, that'll be a good one. You're talking about the speed discrepancies. The other time you can see it is when I play my friend James on FIFA because I'm so bad. He let me lets me play as Spain, and he'll be like japan or like the la galaxy or something uh because (laughs) that's how big the gap is in our play so i can have speed and there are big speed discrepancies but there is literally nothing else good happening so if you want to see it watch mbappe play or watch me play james in fifa and still lose despite the advantage that he allows me to have we're gonna talk about uh, the nba playoffs here in just one second but first more euro it's always exciting when a player scores a goal in the euros but this year it is twice as exciting 
because FanDuel is paying out double the winnings when you bet on a player to score during a Euro 2020 game. Just sign up for FanDuel Sportsbook and pick your goal scorer for a shot at two times the payout. In a tournament featuring some of the best goal scorers in the the world, you'll have plenty of options to choose from. But no matter who you pick, FanDuel will double your payout up to $250, and you'll have your bonus in less than 72 hours. There is no better place to bet Euro 2020 than on FanDuel Sportsbook. Must be 21 plus in Colorado, uh, Iowa, Indiana, Michigan, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, or West Virginia. New users only. First real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued as a non-withdrawable site credit that expires in seven days. Max bonus $250. Restrictions apply. See full terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In Colorado, call 1-800-522-4700. In Iowa, 1-800-BETS-OFF. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. In Michigan, for confidential help, call 1-800-270-7117. In Tennessee, call the red line 1-800-889-9789. Or in West Virginia, visit 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Let's talk some basketball now with Coach Nick of B-Ball Breakdown. Get his thoughts on the Kawhi Leonard injury, the CP3 uncertainty, and more with where the NBA playoffs currently stand. Covering the present. Let's bring Coach Nick into covering the spread to talk some basketball and what a day it is to talk basketball with everything going on. I appreciate you taking time out of your day to talk to us. How has today been for you with 16,000 different breaking news notifications coming across our phones in the past couple of hours? I mean, I expect nothing less. It's not, somebody tweeted out, uh, somebody woke up at the NBA and chose violence. <laughs> and that's basically <laughs> what this was. I was busy editing all morning until now, so I only was vaguely aware of what's going on. But it's, it's devastating news, at least for the Clippers. Oh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And just like so much news to digest because, I mean, obviously we don't know the the timetable for Chris Paul. So that one's tougher to diagnose, but with Kawhi Leonard and just so much, so much star power has been taken away from these NBA playoffs. Obviously there's no LeBron, no AD anymore, but now you take some of the lingering guys, you still have Kevin Durant who was nuts last night. You still have Giannis obviously, but that's a lot of key players to lose. And just as a basketball fan, that's be a bummer to have so many of these these big names not available, whether it be due to losses or due to injuries. Uh, it really is. It's and you know people want to point to these short off season in between before this year started. Uh, you know, not every team had that. I mean, certainly the eight teams that didn't go to the bubble had tons of time off. Um, but I suppose, yeah, if we're going to include the top stars, they all got to the bubble. They all played, you know, somewhat in the playoffs. So uh, I, I would hope it wasn't related, but it's hard to ignore that fact. And it really is causing um, a lot of these series to be, you know, lopsided to some degree. I mean, listen, I love the Suns. I love what they're doing. They're exciting. They play really well. But quite honestly, you know, with AD still being healthy, it felt like the Lakers were going to win that series. And now the Suns might get all the way to the finals from that. Yeah. It's uh, it's been crazy, and we're talk about the implications of that, and also talk about uh, the Kawhi Leonard injury. Talk about Bucks Nets, and a lot coming up later on. But because you are mostly in the X's and O's side of things, I want to talk to you about betting, infiltrating your sphere, and obviously with the legalization of sports betting kind of spreading throughout the U.S., you're probably seeing a lot more of it, whether it be on your YouTube chats or on Twitter, or anything like that. And you probably see a lot of things that might irk you. I don't know if irk you is the right word to phrase that. But, like, you probably see things that are like, okay, you're overlooking this. So when you see betting discourse occurring, whether it be on YouTube or anywhere you're at, what are the things you think that we as bettors are overlooking when we're talking about these games each and every night? Well, you know, since I started this channel, what I become aware of is that there are guys who want to bet on games who like to watch what I'm offering because it gives them an edge or they think it gives them an edge. So, uh, you know, I tangentially kind of, you know, observe what's going on and what the ideas are, you know, across daily fantasy or just even just regular betting. Um, You know, it seems like to answer that question, I suppose I sort of just figure out what do I bring that I think maybe gives them that edge? Um, Because everybody knows who's injured and who's not, what they're other on the second of a back to back, all that stuff, which, by the way, for like that ends up being as important as any X's and O's, right? Especially in the, in the course mm-hmm. of a season. And I love the fact that you guys have all that data at your disposal. Uh, and then there are certain like lineup stuff. Now the lineup data I'm always going through too is really important as far as the coaching side. And I think that 
when you when you experience certain coaches, for instance, who don't seem to focus on lineup data enough, perhaps, and you get these weird lineups, you get these weird, you know, people like, you know, listen, uh, Budenholzer shot his shot last night and threw in a guy who, you know, really hadn't played the whole year and he's now playing second quarter minutes in, um, gosh, I can't remember his name now because it was so obscure to me. <laughs> I'll I'll tell you in a second if like my mind's blank, but nonetheless, you know that that's that's kind of interesting at the very least. So, at the very least, I, I do think that there's a lot of sort of um, when you understand the way the teams play defense, and I'll a lot of times try and break that stuff down. That to me, I think gives you some insight, especially when you're going up against a team that has a specific offensive skill. So, like the Bucks are a good example where they continually leave uh, three point shooters open. And they've done that for years and they've gotten away with it, having a very high defensive rating for those years, except for this year, when all of a sudden, you know, those open shots, they're finally hitting them. It was a little strange to me why they weren't hitting them before. But those are the two things when you realize, OK, that the top shooting team is going to go up against them. We know they're going to get a lot of threes. They're not going to miss from the playoffs. And so that's going to be a recipe for disaster for them. And, you know, short of Kyrie getting hurt, which is another thing we can discuss if you want to blame Giannis or not. But, um, you know, th- this series would have been would be over quicker, quicker than not in the Nets favor had Kyrie stayed healthy. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, the randomness of three pointers is definitely something that us analytics folks have been talking about for a while. You don't expect it to persist for so long like it, it has for Milwaukee. Uh, but that certainly seems like a factor in that series. I think, I mean, Durant went off last night. I don't know how many of his shots, was he just going off from three? Oh, well, he was, you know, he was going off from everywhere. And, you know, basically they played Brooke Lopez off the floor, but then they put Brooke, Brooke Lopez back in the game. It was very strange uh, that he did that. That said, I don't know who they're supposed to put on him. I mean, here's the thing. I, I study the actual individual possessions because I want to know it's not good enough for me to see what you know Durant's field goal percentage is what are they doing why is that working and what can they do to stop that and so you know they 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 were very reluctant to have Middleton on him even though he's the only guy that's anywhere near the size they need now Giannis is the other guy but he has been terrible when he guards uh KD and so they know not to put him on there so that's at least they recognize that um but he was doing it from all over the floor and it's such a high percentage at some point in the middle of all that, he hit like, what, 11 shots in a row or something. You have to have anybody else shoot it by hook or by crook. I don't care what you do to get the ball, to not let him catch it and not let him have it. Um, and if you know there's a guy who's stubborn who doesn't want to change the game plan, and it seems like Boonholzer is like that because he keeps you know, uh, having him uh, being guarded by T- P.J. Tucker, then um, you know, that would probably give you some really interesting insights into well, maybe you want to bet on how many points Durant's going to get. I just happen to have predicted 50 points you know hours before the game yesterday and he missed the gosh darn free throw at the end that would have given him exactly 50 and made me look a lot better but still it was it was all right there for you well you're you're missing by one is uh is uh, certainly certainly fine uh however you look at it so let's get into some of the news. I mean, one of the first ones was, was uh, Chris Paul is out, quote unquote, indefinitely with COVID-19. Uh, Suns are still, um, you know, plus 500 to win the finals. Uh, what do you see with the Suns uh, and 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 the issues with Paul now? Um, you know, we need more information, obviously, because if he's uh, I think Jalen um, Jalen Rose said that he was vaccinated. So if we take him for the, his word, then that shouldn't be a very long uh, quarantine or whatever or protocol they're going to put him through. Uh, and the way this Laker, uh, the Clippers jazz series is going, he probably would be ready by the time that starts. So that shouldn't affect anything. If he's not ready, obviously, that's a big problem. And I, Suns fans got so upset at me when I was questioning after game three of the Lakers series how they got that second seed because they didn't look like a second seeded team through three games and you know what through three and a half games they didn't look that way either and then AD goes down so uh but what it does tell you is that obviously Chris Paul is the linchpin of that of that game of that team they need him to be uh, as close as that he can be to 100 percent uh the way he just you know he destroyed down the stretch in the fourth quarter or the uh in the in that fourth game uh just hitting those mid-range shots over and over again off the pick and roll uh, without him, uh, they are they they the odds have to be. Uh, I mean, are you saying the odds are plus five hundred without him? No, that's that's, with- that's where they stand right now with the information that we have. So okay. I think that based on the way that they sit right now, I think the sports books are treating this the the Suns as if 
Paul will be good to go. That's kind of yeah. my read on it, at least. Yeah. So I wouldn't put too much stock in in, the, in him missing any games due to due to the COVID. Uh, and, it, and by the way, if he well, by the way, unless he got COVID, right. and if he got it after getting vaccinated, then he is the most uh, unlucky. You know, he's the the cooler of all coolers, and do not bring him with you to Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So uh, we're gonna talk more about the Suns in a second here too. But first, we're gonna decide who they're going to face. And that changed potentially on Wednesday too, because Kawhi Leonard apparently has an ACL injury. It's not been said if it's a tear or what the extent of it is, but it sounds like it's going to take him out likely for this series here versus the Jazz. The Jazz, seven-point favorites in this game against the Clippers for tonight. So let's talk about this Kawhi injury. How does it alter your view of this game tonight, but also the series as a whole between the Jazz and the Clippers? Right. Well, you know, it's funny because in my memory of looking about it in, in the middle of game four, as it was pretty much a blowout, I was thinking, gosh, you know, the first two games were blowouts and the next two games were blowouts. Have we ever really had a series like that? But then when I went back and actually thought about it, game one was not a blowout. Neither was game two. So the Jazz really had, you right. know, uh, they, they had a, a grip on those games, but it wasn't like it was as uh, overwhelming as what the Clippers were doing. And I mean, one look at the numbers and it's like pretty clear that it's Kawhi was driving a lot of that. But you know, I, I'm pretty sure we recognized that play when he did tear the ACL. And then that, that's it. He's done. He's not playing the rest of the playoffs. There's no way you could, you know, come back from that. Even though we did, it, he seemed like he did play after he heard it. Um, so now you got to rely on Paul George, who I thought was magnificent down the stretch without Kawhi at the end of that game. So that's still something they can put their hat on because he was great. Now, we don't know if he can be great in a game five or a game six, right? We have to find that out. I love Paul George. I've known him since he got in the league. Uh, Incredible progression for him and how he's improved to the point where he is now. Uh, But there are legitimate questions about whether he can handle that pressure uh, as the man. Um, And, you know, so far in game four, yeah, there's no question if you ask Ty Lue, he'd be like, we're great. We're ready to go. Uh, We'll be able to, uh, you know, uh, cover that with uh, probably spot starting. I bet you Kennard might get some more run. I was advocating for him in the first couple games before they put him in. And then, Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, in the playoff series before that with the Mavericks and they weren't playing him and he finally got in. Um, you know, so he, he would probably get some of those minutes. I'm trying to think of who else, uh, who else is slotted in that, in that behind him for, uh, Kawhi's minutes. Yeah. So it sounds like, I mean, you know, the, the jazz have kind of been two, three ish point favorites at, uh, at home. And now they're a seven point favorite. It sounds like you have enough faith in, in Chris Paul that that might be a lot of points to, to move that spread. Oh, wait, do we go back to Chris Paul? Okay. No, wait, uh, Kawhi Leonard. I think you meant. Sorry. Sorry, Kawhi. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> So do I have enough faith in Paul George? Yeah. Yeah. I, I Well, geez, I don't know. So game <laughs> five is in Utah, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So that's tough. And, you know, the Jazz are good. And I, I'm really, by the way, I just want to say as a coach, I'm so impressed by Quinn Snyder. Whenever they show him talk uh, on the bench and whenever, whenever you've seen him in the past, like after in postgame, uh, you know, uh, press conferences, he's there's just something about the way he talks and explains. And there's no question that, that he'll be able to have – uh, tremendous adjustments and in-game adjustments to help them win those games if they could figure it out. Um, but again, I'm still not sold in the Jazz as a team uh, overall. Rudy still has interesting issues with me, and I, I don't feel like the, the Clippers have fully exploited him uh, all the way. And uh, we'll find out if if Lou and those guys have figured something else out where they could get him uh, attacking a little bit more. Although he hasn't been as big of a factor in my mind as like he would be in a regular season game. So maybe they're okay with him having to sort of, you know, being what he's doing. They're winning by double digits and that's okay. So um, it, I, I don't know, man, this is such a, such a difficult thing. You have to imagine losing a starter like Kawhi is going to hurt them. Uh, and, and without much time to prepare, you have to be able to say that a home team game five, they're going to win that. Now, on top of that, uh, what are the odds? The odds of a game of 2-2 winning the game five is 80%, 90% of winning the whole series? Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. It's, and so it's at hard, that it's point, hard for the, yeah, it's hard for a team to win two in a row when one of them's on the road. Right. So, so there, you know, that kind of answers the question there. I mean, that's why this is the most important game, you know, for of them of their series season for, you know, in the last couple of years. Although I guess you can, never mind, they had the tough ones last year. So, um, this is it. This is this is the series in my mind and um, it's really unfortunate that that the Clippers are having to out of whole cloth like come up with a new game plan with missing someone like Kawhi uh, Kawhi. It's not like, you know, uh, the seventh man goes down and they can plug somebody else in. This is this is a lot different. Absolutely. And that's why we see this uh, big spread for tonight. So let's talk about what happens after that, because obviously we're recording this Wednesday, not a lot of turnaround time there, but we can look ahead and kind of 
get some idea of what to expect for the Suns in their next round, whether it be against the Clippers or the Jazz. And that's kind of why we wanted you on here for today, Coach, is because like you you understand the, the way teams mesh together. So when you look ahead to a potential Western Conference Finals, let's assume CP3 is good to go, just because that's the way it sounds like things will be that way. Let's assume Kawhi is not, because again, that's probably the way things are trending. How would these teams mesh for you based on the two potential matches we have awaiting next round in the Western Conference? Okay, so we want to look at, we're thinking about the Suns versus Clippers and then the Suns versus Jazz. You want to do both of those? Let's do it. All right, all right. Well, let's see here. So um, it's interesting because with Paul George and Kawhi Leonard, certainly they can match up nicely across the board uh, with what they have. Uh, you know, the Suns are an interesting team. You know, the, uh, the Clippers have like guys like Patrick Beverly who they can stick on CP3 and make life miserable for him there. Um, and, you know, on Booker as well, that's where Paul George, I, I cannot wait to see that. That'd be a really fun matchup to finally see Paul George. You know, he's been not as good as he's been in the past on defense, but there are moments. And I would imagine that, you know, they're going to throw him on, um, uh, on Devin Booker. You know, the only question then would be is if, you know, if, since Kawhi is not in there, they can try and give him a break on defense a little bit. And so now that's the question, like, who is it? Reggie's going to have to guard him a little bit. Uh, so that, that's really the key here. And I do feel like the Suns could have the advantage on that one because of how they're going to have to manage Paul George. So that's interesting. Uh, and now on the flip side, certainly Mikhail Bridges is one of my favorites as far as defensively. I think he can do a lot of stuff to handle, you know, Paul George, if that's who he's going to go against. So I, the Clippers have, uh, have enough um, defensively, I think, to match up okay with those guys. But again, it's just cool. You're missing, you know, you're taking the best guy off the team. It says, I don't know if they're going to have enough firepower in the, at the end of the day. They probably defensively could do enough to hang in there, but I think they might ultimately, you know, falter down the stretch without that guy. Uh, obviously, Paul George is going to have to be that guy. And in the Western Conference we'll, finals, we'll see. And on the flip side, you know, the Jazz, I, you know, they haven't been able to really convince me, and they still haven't, obviously, with where they are now. And so, uh, you know, who, like on the Sun side, who guards Donovan Mitchell? You know, uh, that's going to be, if it's CP3, okay. Well, he's long in the tooth. He's not as effective defensively as he used to be, but that's interesting. And then, they'll, you know, Devin Booker's got a guard of Royce O'Neal. Royce O'Neal probably gets a lot of that, the bulk of that. And he's he's good. He's not, like, great. He's not, uh, he doesn't, like, you know, become elite defensively, I don't think, but he's solid. Um, but the way you see Donovan Mitchell attacking, I don't think that that's going to be uh, a great matchup for them. And that's going to put a lot more pressure on guys like Aiton to stay out of foul trouble. Um, so I, I don't know. I think they'd be really evenly matched, and I think they would be a great Western Conference Finals, but I don't know if you can really pick anybody definitively uh, of those three teams uh, to win. Great. Coach, let's move on to the Hawks and Sixers series. Uh, where It's 2-2. They're going into Game 5 tonight as we're recording this on Wednesday. You had a great breakdown of just really specific aspect of this game, how the Sixers are defending Trey Young and the pick and roll. And it looked like, you know, Trey Young's had some success. He had, I think it was a down game in, in uh, game two, but they've been pretty good the last two games. Uh, I, I suggest everyone go watch it because it's really interesting. But what can we take from that? Like, what do we expect these last three games? Like, can the Sixers defend this and, and win this series as, as the favorites that they, they are? Yeah, well, you know, and thanks for watching it. Um, you know, I had done, I was preparing for the game before that by uh, for the first three games, uh, charting every single pick and roll that Trey ran. And because they won the game in game one and they were awesome in the pick and roll, and then they lost the game in game two when the pick and roll was not nearly as effective, and then they were awesome again in game three, but they, but, sorry, the Hawks were, and they lost the game anyway. And so that was what I was like, couldn't do the video after I kind of like the, the narrative <laughs> right. wasn't there. It didn't make sense. So it was like, ah, and I wait and I had to go to, to an uh, event. So I kind of had spun my wheels, but I figured, you know what, after game four, at least, you know, the Hawks won again. So that, and then they did very well in the pick and roll or well. So that finally gave me impetus. I could use all that data. So basically this is what it comes down to. Uh, the, the Sixers guarding the pick and roll when Trey Young is handling the ball. And then on the flip side, the Hawks being able to do something with, you know, MB down low, who has just been eating all, all day long and they can't right. seem to do much to stop him, even though Capella is, you know, give him credit, give him a pat in the back. He's trying, but uh, his numbers are, are crazy good. So, um, you know, I, I think I've detected a little bit of a notion that when they drop too far against Trey Young, uh, those are the ones are when he gets the open floaters or then the lobs to Capella. Those are the ones that they really haven't been able to stop very well. 
Uh, I have seen enough evidence to, you know, not perfect, but but enough where when Embiid gets up high enough to uh, dissuade him from taking that floater, and then they can kind of get in there with a, with the tagging and the weak side to handle the the lob a little bit. Those are the moments when they can actually get a couple stops. And that takes a lot of effort, you know, from Embiid to be able to do that because they're obviously the guy they're targeting him. That's my favorite pastime in the playoffs, by the way, is looking at the pairings. Who the? Because remember, when you run a pick and roll, you get to decide who you bring up to screen with, right? Who's guarding the the screening, the uh, the the ball screener? And so uh, that's been a fascinating thing. And obviously, Embiid has the brunt of that. Uh, but they do get a little bit, um, you know, creative with who they screen with and where they screen. Uh, and so as a result, that's going to be the, the puzzle that I believe the Sixers are going to have to solve. They're not going to be able to simply just rely on Embiid. Uh, they're going to have to do some stops on the defensive end with that pick and roll. And that's that's going to be the key. So you were talking before about coaching and having faith in coaches. Do you think that Doc Rivers is someone who will be able to diagnose that and decide, OK, this is our fix here and it's worthwhile to burn the energy on Embiid to do that? Or do you think this will continue to be an advantage the Hawks have for the remainder of the series? Uh, it's unclear to me uh, that Doc has uh, in-game adjustments. Uh, you rate him that high on in-game adjustments. Uh, you know, it doesn't ever seem to have been his thing. You know, it's funny on Twitter. They were like, oh, another big lead blown uh, by Doc Rivers. And, you know, it, it, it is true. They're littered that way with, uh, with you know, with blown leads uh, across the board for years and years. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that that is a, a slight deficiency in uh, in his abilities um, that, you know, it, it could very well be a, um, a, a generational thing. Like some some of those guys were like former players and you know, older, older than me. They kind of like want to dig in and really stick to their guns. And um, I don't know. It seems like the coaches that are a little bit more flexible and, and you know, are willing to, uh, you know, possession to possession, try and alter some stuff like, you know, usually the coaching you know fraternity would kind of you know tip their cap to those kind of coaches more um so i don't have a lot of faith but i'll just answer that question that they'll adjust more but then again you know mb could go off uh, they might get some good produ production out of simmons which is another issue i feel like is, is a problem that pairing to me i don't think gets into the finals but we'll see and um and so yeah so they, they, they might be able to kind of overwhelm them like they have been and, and hold that lead but again uh, if they allow that to happen, uh, the Hawks get on a roll and they'll start scoring, uh, hitting threes. And by the way, that's the biggest issue, right, is the threes. They, when they lost the game, it's because they didn't shoot well from three uh, so well. So that's that's the real key there. And that's, again, another part of the pick and roll where once they start to collapse that and they kick out and they get wide open shots, you know, when they hit them, uh, the Sixers are going to be in trouble. Yeah, for sure. So, Coach, you've given us uh, two coaches that you're not uh, so enthused about their in-game adjustments, Budenholzer and, and Rivers. Um you know, maybe give us a coach that you are enthused about uh, who, who can give uh, these in-game adjustments and, and maybe give you an edge on a money line. Great. Uh, OK, that's good. I'd rather be positive, I suppose. <laughs> and, and forgive me, uh, Coach Coach Bud and Coach. Uh, I mean, listen, there's a couple other ones who have you seen my videos. I've been a little bit uh, uh, scratching <laughs> right. my head about. But who are good? Who is good? Um, I mean, you know, who are who's still in in the game? I mean, let's see. I, I would probably I would put Quinn Snyder in that list for sure. Um, <laughs> they, they seem, you know, to use analytics as well and really study that stuff um, to, to inform them, which is important. That's why I like I love analytics. So it's like 10 times people want to accuse me of, of either not listening to them or not liking them. But I really feel like applied properly in the right instances yeah. really can help. Um, so I would put Quinn Snyder on there. I mean, yeah. Who else is left uh, that, if we're talking about just the, uh, the playoff coaches? Who are we talking about? Um I mean, Steve Nash is first year coach in Brooklyn. Yeah. No, I wouldn't put him up there, unfortunately, even though he's got like, you know, a lot of um, people behind him on the bench. Um, I, I, you know, I haven't felt like I felt great about those, you know, any kind of adjustments that they've been making. They haven't had to make them, by the way, really, until all of a sudden now that they're hurt. And at this point, what are you going to do? You know, and by the way, playing Kevin Durant 48 minutes, it, it, I don't know about you, but I was scared watching that and get, seeing that he that was going to happen the last like six minutes. You knew it wasn't going to come out. That's just that's just a recipe for you know they've already dealing with injuries, uh, and then they played Harden uh, forty four yeah. minutes, whatever 46. that was. Like that's just yep. anyway. So that's not an adjustment, but that's certainly something that really gave me pause. And um, who else right. is left besides that? Uh, let's see, Monty. Hmm. I don't know. What are the what do the gambler people say about Monty's coaching? Anything? I'm 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 not sure. I'm I'm not the right person to ask. All right, no worries. Uh, 
Monty Williams, I don't know. So it's funny because Greg Popovich's tree is, you know, Monty Williams is part of that. And like, he's the kind of guy who, you know, listen, he is the gold standard for coaching, but I don't know. I, I feel like there are, and but by the way, when you sign a, a head coaching contract, you acknowledge and you accept the fact that you're going to get, you know, criticized by jerks like me all day long. Right? So, um, but like, you know, like Popovich, for instance, he won't follow up by a three. Drives me absolutely right. insane. And it's right. probably because he's just he's just dogmatic about it. He, he, we didn't have to deal with that like before the three point shot became really big. So he just he has a way he wants to do it. He, maybe he feels like, well, if we can't stop him on defense, we don't deserve to win. Maybe that's how he feels. Um, and sometimes I feel like that permeates some of the other coaches that have come out of his tree as well. Uh, I mean, mm-hmm. Boylan might be a good example of that uh, when he was in Chicago, which was a nightmare. And um, meanwhile, uh, so Monty is part of that. But um, and I don't think he follows up by three either, which is another one of those just signs. It's like one of those flashing signs to me. So, you know, he's OK. But and, and you know, so other than that, uh, I don't know. I guess the answer. I'm sorry. I'm so long winded today. But uh, Quinn Snyder, I think, would be the guy if I had to pick anybody who's the in-game, in-game adjustment you know, uh, leader right now. Well, there's a reason we had you on. It's because we wanted to hear you talk. So this is great. This is perfect. This is exactly why you're here. You talked about Kevin Durant in the 48 minutes on Tuesday night. James Harden went 46. Didn't look effective, I think, in that time. Uh, Harden didn't. So let's talk about game six because Durant probably going to be pretty gassed for Thursday. Harden not fully healthy right now. What are you expecting here in game six based on what you saw on Tuesday night? Well, you know, and I would think that – so here's the thing. Durant only took 10 shots in the first half. Part of that was uh, Tucker was actually doing okay, like denying him. But when you look at the quality of shots they got out of that, uh, they were all really good, and the, the Nets just missed. You know, I don't think that's going to happen again. They're in hostile – oh, no, they're – yeah, wait, where are they in game six? They're in oh. Milwaukee. So they're on in hostile territory. But, um, I, you know, you have to imagine they're going to make a few of those. I mean, you know, even like Joe Harris missed a layup on uh, when they were going to get stuck to Duran. He cut back door like that stuff. And by the way, once you miss a couple of those, that's when you get the 12 to 20, whatever leads, those bigger leads, which always disappear, by the way. So never be concerned about a big lead early in the first quarter. But it does, you know, put you on the eight ball for a while. That said, I did tweet this out earlier Um you know, after uh, with uh, seven minutes left in the third quarter, that was when they built their 16 point lead, whatever the uh, the Bucks did. From then on, the 19 minutes left in the game, uh, they got scored like 23 points. That's, that's a severe blowout when you're doing more than a point a minute uh, outscoring the other team. So um, I would expect more of the same. I would expect Durant to be, you know, again, more aggressive. The funny thing was in the very beginning, Durant didn't look good. I thought the whole team looked kind of rattled. And um, meanwhile, Harden does have eight assists and he made a couple of passes that nobody else on the floor would have been able to make. So uh, here's the thing that you can treat the hamstring. It held up amazingly. Uh, I would imagine that the treatment they can do between now and then uh, will benefit him and he might be even a little bit better. So maybe he'll hit a couple shots. And then uh, then I, I don't know, I, unless the, the Bucks can radically figure out how to deal with uh, Durant attacking out of the pick and roll, especially if it's if it's um, Brooke Lopez. Uh, I, I don't know if they're going to get enough stops because Giannis is, you know, Giannis's game is limited. He doesn't necessarily play like an MVP. Now, it was great to see them go down low to him and let him say, you know, win the game for us in the fourth quarter on the post. That was great. And he did score a couple times, but they just follow him, put him on the line. He'll he'll probably make one of two. <laughs> Uh, you know, and he looks shaky there, even, you know, when the ones he makes. Um, and then then that that's a real question mark of whether that's going to get them a, a win in a must game, must win situation in a game six, even though they're home. So uh, I, I kind of feel OK about the Nets, you know, for, for now. I didn't feel very good before the game started. But uh, after game five, I, I feel like uh, they, they have a really legitimate shot at winning that game and closing out the series. Yeah, sometimes with Harden, you know, just just the fact that he was out there for 46 minutes, even if he wasn't playing well, that fact is an endorsement of health for the future. So I think that is intriguing for sure as well. Uh, We'll see. Yeah, yeah, we'll see for sure how things go in game six. uh, Coach Nick just uploaded a video on Kevin Durant in game five. So go check that out. There is a link to the YouTube page over on the show notes up on numberfire.com. That is Coach Nick. Make sure you give him a follow on Twitter at B-Ball Breakdown. Coach, we appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Enjoy the basketball tonight and the rest of the playoffs. And uh, hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. I'm in. Thanks so much. Covering the future. 
Big thank you once again to Coach Nick for swinging by and breaking down his thoughts on the NBA playoffs. And Eddie was talking about the Jazz believing in analytics. Uh, we both know Keith Goldner, who uh, works for Number Fire and FanDuel. He used to consult the Jazz on analytics. So uh, obviously... That's very true, and it's good to hear that that is still there uh, for the Jazz. And obviously, paying off very well for them. They're plus 250 to win the NBA Finals right now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the Jazz were the one seed in the West, and, uh, you know, they, they right? Is that right? Yeah, they got the one seed because Phoenix was the two. Um, and, you know, the other thing about Jazz is that, you know, Coach Quinn Snyder is by far the most successful of the Coach K disciples. Um, you know, I mean, he... he uh, you know, what had, about Chris had, Collins? Come on. What? You know, he he led Northwestern to like three wins this year. How are we going to snub Chris Collins? Come is, on. Is he still is he still coaching at Northwestern? Don't talk to me about this. <laughs> no, I mean, that was a serious question. Is he, He's still there, right? Yes. It's a sore <laughs> point. It's a sore spot. Anyway, Quinn Snyder, uh, most successful uh, Coach K disciple, um, didn't... I had some issues at Missouri, um, but he's really done well in the NBA. And that kind of gives me, brings me back to that Coach K is retiring after this year. And instead of, you know, picking your most successful disciple as a coach in Quinn Snyder, I don't know if Quinn Snyder would actually take the job because it sounds like, you know, he's doing pretty well in the NBA and some guys really want to coach in the NBA. But instead of, you know, getting someone who has coached as a head coach, in college basketball, they're promoting John Shire, a 34-year-old who has never been a head coach, which I think is is a fascinating choice. Um, the odds of that working out uh, are not very high in my mind. So, uh, but that's what Duke has decided to do because this man is so intelligent. I'm curious if you had to pick, you're offered the head coaching job in Michigan and the Philadelphia Eagles. What are you picking? In. Uh, Wait, me personally, or wait, who? Or you can pick Rice or Stanford too. Like you're offered these jobs. Are you going college or NFL from a head coaching perspective? Well, I mean, most people in football would say to take the NFL job, right? So that that certainly. I don't want to recruit, man. Like I, I don't want to recruit. I, give me the NFL job. Give me the pro job every day of the week. So like, if that was Snyder's dilemma, I would say if he were offered it, I would say he made the right choice. Interesting. I don't want to deal with boosters, recruiting. I, I want no part of that. That sounds miserable. But you have I to want deal with the GM that makes potentially horrible draft picks too, right? So it, true, you know. true. So if you're a high, you know, if you're a college coach, at least you get you have more uh, input into crafting your team. This is true. Uh, more input, more headaches, more time. I'll take the I'll take the less input, fewer headaches more time that's my yeah, route yeah, but that, that could get your butt fired though you know yeah but if i get i guess like the the angle for college is you get the buyout like if i can get the um the mm. the 200 or you know the 20 million dollar buyout to sit and do nothing that is kind of appealing but like i don't think i'd be good enough to get the buyout in my contract to begin with so it's uh there are if a lot of angles to consider of jobs you're you're gonna get some buyout yeah, you know, as long as you hire a reasonable agent, that's also money. I don't know, man. It's a lot of headaches. A lot yeah. of headaches here. Yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to minimize the headaches. Yeah, so I hear you. Uh, that would be where I would go. Either way, big thank you to Coach Nick for swinging by and talking about the NBA playoffs here for today. Let's move into covering the future and talk about some more exciting stuff on the horizon here on the sports calendar. The U.S. Open is this week. It's at Torrey Pines South. They were there earlier this year for the Farmers Insurance Open. At least three out of the four rounds were there. But now they're back once again. And, Ed, you want to talk some golf as you are now the the golf guy here on our <laughs> podcast. What That's are you seeing here for Torrey Pines South? That's still hilarious to even hear me <laughs> referenced in, in terms of golf. But yeah, I, I think it's kind of interesting how much the markets, the golf markets are about what you've done lately. Uh, John Rahm's actually a betting favorite at FanDuel Sportsbook. Um, if you haven't heard, uh, he tested positive for COVID. Oh, was that two weeks ago? Yeah. yeah. I don't know if he played last week, but. He did not. He was not cleared until Sunday to golf, okay. but he was cleared Sunday. So he's good to go for this week. Yeah, he's good to go for this week. So so he's the favorite. Uh, I think a lot of the models would probably have him as a favorite because he's, you know, he is one of the favorites of uh, golf analytics. Uh, you know, as I, I think I've mentioned on the show, you know, Rufus Peabody's always talked about how he's bet more money on on John Rahm. Um, I think he also tweeted that he lost uh, 
six digits when Rom uh, yeah. wasn't able to win that tournament. Yeah, uh, because that's of rough. the COVID test. That sucks, man. That that is a bad beat right there. That's brutal. He had a six shot lead. Six shot lead. So brutal. So we talked about John Rom. We talked about Xander Schauffele as kind of the the numbers favorites. Uh, but I think the one golfer that we haven't talked about is Joaquin Neiman. So he's a 22-year-old Chilean that uh, is another golfer that's shown up in some of Brandon Gadula's numbers. He's shown up in Colin Davies' numbers as, uh, as, as a really good golfer, a really good young golfer. Um, and to me, it's interesting. I think with the PGA, he was maybe plus 2,000 to win. And then last week, he didn't make a cut, which was the first cut he hadn't made in a year, I think, from, from what I've tracked. And he's plus 7,000. Uh, to to win the U.S. Open uh, this week. And um, I wasn't able to get as accurate numbers as I usually get uh, for this tournament, but that seemed like such a crazy shift in opinion on this golfer that that I had to I had to get some action in on that. So I ended up betting him top 20 uh, over at DraftKings for plus 225. Uh, that was a better price than I could find on FanDuel. I think he is a golfer that the numbers really like. Yes, he missed the cut last week, but uh, I don't think that... Uh, obscures what he's done over the last year and is a probably very underrated golfer. And, um, you know, Brandy Gadula talked about that as well in his article this week. He, he was one of the golfers that had a little bit of an edge in the outright markets. Not much, but a little bit. I pulled yeah. that up just to check it out when you were talking about it. It's uh, He's at 1.5% in the Sims versus 1.4% implied. So there is some value there, but I, I mean, like, it's 1.5% odds of happening. So I think yep. that the top 20 market, probably the better route for you there. Yeah. I mean, you could, you can try like top 10 too. I think it was plus 500 yeah. when I checked at FanDuel. Uh, you get a little bit more leeway with top 20. Uh, but this is a, this is a golfer that's kind of, you know, and he's, I, I think he, he hasn't won any tournaments, but I think he's got two second place finishes within the last calendar year. So uh, a good young golfer and uh, wouldn't make too much that he, that he missed the cut last week. And the thing with Neiman too, is I think that we've kind of forgotten the improvements he made over the winter where he, his big issue in the past was putting on non bent grass surfaces where he just couldn't make a putt. He would joke about it. He was very aware of it. Couldn't do it. And he made a lot of improvements over the winter and Cooled off a bit with his irons, but long term, Joaquin Neiman is a tremendous iron player. You expect that to show back up if we're trying to project out in the future, which is why it makes sense you want to buy low on Neiman for right now. So I think that Neiman is a really solid bet. Uh, he ranks sixth in the field in distance gain the past 50 rounds. That's over at Fantasy National. Good numbers when you adjust for field strength. So uh, Joaquin Neiman. Definitely someone who is a, I th I'd agree, a viable betting option for this week at the U.S. Open. I am also focusing on a non-outright for my covering the future. Uh, the Cup Series is in Nashville this week for the first time. It's a new track, and it's a pretty unique one. I can't, if you will force me to list a comp track for this, this one, I can't. There are no comps. Uh, it's 1.33 miles in length. That is similar to Darlington, but Darlington is an egg. Uh, Nashville is a trioval. It's concrete like Bristol and Dover. It's flat like Phoenix and Richmond. Basically, it's a, a melting pot of all these different tracks. There's no good direct comp for this one, and that can make it tough for betting. I have baked in some extra uncertainty for this week as a result, but the overall idea for me is to look at who has done the best in the 750 horsepower package, which is what they're running this weekend. So looking at who has done well at the tracks listed, like Bristol, Dover, Phoenix, Richmond, and kind of mesh them all together. And once I do that, Joey Logano, shocker, looks like a clear value for me once again. Specifically, I want to bet him uh, to Podium, which is finished top three, which is plus 350 at FanDuel Sportsbook. Logano actually leads my model in projected average running position for this race prior to practice and qualifying. That does not account for upside. So if I'm looking at the most likely winner, it's not Logano. Uh, he's behind Kyle Larson and Martin Truex Jr. there, but he's been crazy consistent in the 750 package so far this year. There have been six races on ovals using this package. In those six races, Logano has a win. He has three podium finishes. That's a 50% rate in the implied odds of plus 350 or 22.2%. Obviously, that's not. you're not going to say, oh, I expect him to finish on the podium half the time going forward, that'd be stupid. But I think it's encouraging that he specifically run well on the flatter tracks, 
He re- finished second in Phoenix. Uh, he was third in Richmond. Richmond also is a track that features heavier tire wear, which I would expect out of Nashville this week because it is concrete. Bristol raced similarly to that because it was slick and it was on dirt, and that's where Logano won. So most of my betting this week for Nashville will be reserved until after practice. I don't show a ton of value in the outright market right now. Like Logano might be the only guy who actually shows value there, Uh, but it's possible we'll have a, a better read on things once those practice sessions are done. I want to hold off on betting until Saturday for the most part, but I think the value we are getting on Logano right now at plus 350 to podium is enough where I will actually make that one bet right now for Logano to finish top 10 this week. But Ed, it's kind of weird. Like this would be is as if you had a golf course where you didn't know what would happen. We know what Torrey Pine South will do but with NASCAR. We don't really have any data. They've not been to this track ever in the cup series. They've not been here since 2011 it's kind of frightening to try to make bets when we have key pieces of information just not available to us. True, but I mean, maybe that maybe that helps you with with your general knowledge of the sport, right? Right, and I think that was the case for the Bristol race because sports books I thought were being overreactive to guys who'd run on dirt before. I still built out my model regularly if I it had been mm-hmm. like a regular Bristol race, and it performed really well. So I'm okay making bets as a result of that, given how things did at Bristol, making assumptions, building stuff out based on that. And when I do that, it does favor Logano for this week. Podium plus 350, sign me up for that. That is all that we have for covering the spread for this week. Once again, no show next week because uh, we got some vacation baked in. So no show next week. Back again the week after that with more thoughts on the NBA, Euro 2020, and more. Make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. Also, make sure you follow Coach Nick on Twitter. He is at B-Ball Breakdown. There is a link to his YouTube page up on the show notes up on numberfire.com. Check out his stuff there, his video on Kevin Durant in Game 5, and also I'm sure of reactions to Wednesday night's game on Thursday. Ed, what is going on for you over at the Power Rank right now? Yeah, so uh, um, my free email newsletter, I'm trying to give uh, actionable data-driven betting advice. Uh, probably have something about Euro uh, by the end of the week, so check that out at thepowerrank.com. Uh, also had uh, Bud Elliott on the Football Analytics Show, nice. uh, so hopefully that will be out by the end of this week as well. Uh, he not only bets, but also knows a lot about college football and uh, also is pretty good with analytics too. So uh, that was a fun episode. Um it's fun to get the college football juices flowing again. Not just that, but also Bud with his Southern accent, tremendous content all across the board. So yep. uh, that's outstanding. I'll check that out for sure. Uh, find that by searching for the Football Analytics Show. Follow Ed on Twitter at The Power Rank. I am at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, for running the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Good luck to you with your bets, whether it be on Euro 2020, NBA playoffs, NASCAR, US Open, whatever it may be. Enjoy the sports weekend. We'll talk to you once again in two weeks. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. Aaron Dolan here. Thanks for watching and make sure you click below on that subscribe button for more great FanDuel content and check out some of our latest uploads and playlists right over here.